There are an endless amount of ways to go about building 3D geometry in Lightwave. And what we can do is we can come over to the Create tab and see all these sorts of tools to get us started. And then, of course, as we work with Modify, Multiply, Construct, we can then further manipulate and add to that geometry. One of my favorite ways to create 3D geometry is to take advantage of other programs like Illustrator, Freehand, Photoshop. Uh, these are very common tools amongst graphic artists and uh, though we can build everything from scratch in Lightwave, uh, I found that I can take advantage of some of my other skill sets with, uh, with other apps. So say we were going to work with, I'm going to go over to the image editor and let's just load up this little logo here. Uh, this logo is a 2D logo created by John Telford and uh, he shot me over this image and I said hey this would be a great uh, great image to great logo to work with to build a 3D object from. Now because this was created in another program we've got the source file uh, so I, I contacted John and said, hey, do you, what, what program did you use to create this? He said, Illustrator. I said, oh, that's perfect. Because what we can do is we can take that Illustrator file and bring it right inside of Lightwave. So if you're familiar with working with vector, uh, or, uh, vector art, say out of uh, Illustrator or Freehand, Corel Draw, Flash, Photoshop, or anything that can save an EPS file or an Illustrator file, well, we can take advantage of those source files uh, and bring them right in, and that can cut down our production time uh, by taking advantage of those um, those source files. So what I'm going to do is take that Illustrator file that uh, was used to generate this 2D image and we'll generate a 3D image and a 3D object. So let's go ahead and close that down. Now what I can do is come over to the File, Import, EPS Loader and we're presented with some options. Now the curve division level is how much detail do you want in the curves in the, the vector work in the EPS or Illustrator file? Okay, and we can convert it to polygons, polylines, which are two point polys, or uh, splines or curves. I'm just going to use the default uh, closed poly and uh, polylines. And let's go ahead and pick an Illustrator file, and I'm going to pick that Hackbro logo. Okay. And then we can have it auto axis drill. Now what that'll do is uh, say with the letter O, there's a hole in the center. Well, we could have it go ahead and knock that hole out. Well, that works out really well if it's just simple text. But if you're um, working with a multi-layered graphic like we're going to be working with, uh, it's safer to go ahead and just manually cut the holes so that you get the holes where you want them and you're not leaving it up to this importer to make the guess. Okay, and auto centering, I like to go ahead and work at the origin, so I usually go ahead and have that turned on. Let's click OK. And there we go, we have all the pieces we need to turn this into a 3D logo. But as I zoom in, I start to see that I'm not real happy with the uh, curve division here. It's very choppy, It's uh, we can see facets. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to delete that, come over to File, Import, EPS Loader, and let's set, we'll, we'll just keep the same file, but let's set it to fine. Now, if fine doesn't give us enough detail, then we can go to super fine. If standard was too much detail for what we needed it for, we could go to rough. But I usually work with fine, and then when needed, I go to super fine. So let's try fine. And fine is fine. Fine gives us the amount of uh, curve division that we need. Uh, for the, the use that I want. Now what I'm going to do is we're just going to get rid of this uh, little registered mark uh, and uh, hopefully the lawyers won't come after me. And so that way we can just work on the, the big pieces. Now one thing you might want to do, and I've gotten the habit of doing it every time I load up an EPS or an Illustrator file, is you might want to hit M for merge just in case if there are any points on points, and in this case there were 86 points, that could um, stop us from using things like booleans or drills uh, and, and some other tools. And that could just be that um, when the uh, file was created, some points were right on top of each other or during the conversion. So it's always just a safe thing to do. Hit M for merge, and uh, or if you don't remember the shortcut key, we can come over to the Detail tab and choose Merge Points. And you can see right here on the button, M for Merge, so it's an easy way to remember the shortcut key. Okay, so now we have all the pieces we, we need here. And what I want to do 
is I want to start breaking it out into um, individual pieces so that we can build them up in 3D and then put it back together. Now we could do it all in one layer, but because Lightwave has unlimited layers and we can see up here, we can see 10 of them and we can go to a new bank and see another 10 and keep going. If you're familiar with Illustrator or Photoshop, you might like to use the window layers panel and this is a little, this might be a little more familiar to you. But I'm going to go ahead and we're just going to use a few layers, so I'm going to use this uh, layer system up top. Okay, so let's go ahead and start building this in 3D. I'm going to start with this main back piece. So I'm going to grab these two pieces and I'm going to cut and paste. Then I'm going to take this center piece and cut and I'm going over to a new layer and paste. So in layer one, I have the rest of my pieces. In layer two, I have the main back piece and in layer three, I have the smaller back piece. I'm going to go ahead and put layer two in the foreground and by clicking on the lower portion of layer three, I'm going to put layer three in the background. Come over to construct, drill, and I could use tunnel and that would cut the hole out, but I don't actually want a hole in this case because I still need the back face to, to nestle all the pieces in. So I'm going to make sure that my axis is Z because I can see that I want to, I want to drill down the Z and I'm going to use slice. Slice is going to allow me to, to cut that shape in but still uh, maintain the, the center piece. So I'm going to click OK. And even though we have this piece, I usually keep all my pieces in a, in a kind of a junk layer if I need them back again. But I'm going to go ahead and delete it because I've got everything I need here. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and extrude and say, let's say I want this thickness. Okay, so now I have this thickness. Now on the back, I don't need both of these pieces unless I wanted them. So I'm just going to grab these faces and Shift Z is going to merge all that. Okay, now if I look by selecting these points, I've got some extra points just floating there that I don't need. Now I could select them or I could go to W for statistics and any point that is connected to zero polygons, if I click this plus sign, I can then delete and I'm just trying to stay nice and clean on my geometry all the way through. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is select this middle polygon. I'm going to hit T for move or I could go to modify move and then I could go to multiply and use extender plus or just hit E and then I'm going to move in. Okay, something like that. So now I've created a nice little lip and I can nestle all the pieces into this sunken in area. Okay, so I'm on my way to creating the, the 3D object that I'm after. So let's go ahead and go back to layer one and see what's the next piece that we could work with. I'm going to grab this uh, H shape and uh, just cut it, paste it, go to put this in the background. I'm going to put layer two in the background and I want to see if I'm going to put some pieces on top. Let's just kind of zoom in. I'm going to go ahead and push this in some and I need to give it three dimensions. So just like before I'm going to extrude. If you don't know the shortcut key of shift E, you can always go over to multiply, extrude, and I'm just going to click and drag. And now I've got that three dimensional. So I'm going to cut and paste. Okay, so you can already see that I'm building up my logo in three dimensions, one piece at a time. Now I could do multiple pieces at a, a time, but again, I like to have fine control and, uh, and work this way. I'm going to take the Hackbro logo and cut and paste and then select all these center pieces. Now, if all we were working with was this text in the, e, uh, in the EPS loader, when we had the uh, auto axis drill, this would be a perfect uh, example of when you'd want to use it because there's not a lot of pieces overlaying. It's just one set. But I'm going to go ahead and cut, paste, and drop those pieces in the background. And this time we'll go to construct, drill, and instead of slice, let's use tunnel. And we're going to cut those holes out. Okay, So now we can see right through there. Let's go ahead and get rid of those pieces. Again, you can save them off in a layer if you want. And I'm just going to look and I want these pieces to um, be as thick as this. So I'm just going to go in my top view and slide them back and then shift E, which is the same as multiply extrude. Just give them some thickness. OK, 
Okay, so now I can cut and paste those into layer two. So we're getting real close, just a few more pieces and we'll be there. So let's take a look. Now all we have uh, are these elements here. Let's go ahead and do this little house shape. So I'm going to cut, paste into layer three. Let's grab this middle piece, cut, paste into layer uh, four. I'm going to put layer four in the background, which is that center piece. Come over to construct, drill. Let's tunnel that as well. Let's just cut right through it. So we'll go ahead and click OK. We've cut right through it. I'm going to uh, put layer two in the background just to see how, how thick I want that. And in this case, I do want it to be right on the, uh, the same uh, level as the border. So shift E and I'm just going to extend that sorry extrude that back to fit let's cut and paste okay and so now it's sitting right on top of the H so all that's left I'm gonna go get go ahead and get rid of this uh, this piece we used for the drill come back over here let's cut paste into layer 3 grab these center pieces cut paste into layer 4 and I'm just gonna drop those into the background construct drill tunnel okay and so now we have the holes let's go and put layer two in the background and I I want to pretty much do the same thing with this I want it to come out flush with the house shift E and just extrude back to the H okay so let's cut and paste that Let's get rid of that extra geometry we don't need in layer four. And uh, just to clean things up, let's cut all of it and paste into layer one. So let's take a look at what we have. We have a 3D logo. Now we can still dress this up, but this is a good place where we might want to save. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to File, Save Object, and let's go to the Objects folder, and we'll call this Hack Bro. 001 because we might do further work to it. So let's save 001. Let's go ahead and add a little more detail to this object and then we'll throw some surfaces and textures on it and shoot it over to layout so that we can start getting a render that we can work with. Okay, so I've got the uh, the base object and now I just want to add some detail. One of the details that I like to add to models is a small little bevel, which uh, we call a micro bevel. And it, it's not a micro bevel tool or a micro bevel setting. It's just a very small bevel so that when you go into texture mode and you move the object, you can start to see on the edges, you can start to see a highlight. It really makes geometry pop and it, and it definitely makes the difference between a, uh, a, an amateur model and a professional model to have that nice, nice little micro bevel on there. So let's go ahead and, and take a look. The edges that I'd like a micro bevel on is all these uh, front faces. So I'm just going to grab all these faces, just the front faces, okay, and I'm just shift clicking to grab all these faces. Okay, and with those selected, I just want to add a small little bevel. So I'm going to go over to multiply bevel or B for bevel. And I want to, if I want, I can click and uh, left click and drag and set it interactively. But if I want fine control, what I might want to do is go over to the numeric window and I can use the mini slider just by shift clicking and dragging or I could type it in and I'm gonna try I just want a very tiny little bevel so I'm gonna say for shift two millimeters and for inset two millimeters and let's see what that looks like well I wanted a little little bigger than that so why don't we double it I'm gonna go four and four okay that works for me small little bevel and let's see what the the difference looks like on that so I'm gonna go ahead and hit the uh, spacebar to commit let's deselect and now when I move it you can see light is catching that edge okay so it really makes it pop and you can really see on the letters uh, really makes a big difference so my suggestion is always add those kind of details and you'll always have a, a more professional looking model okay so one of the things that I'm noticing is that I'm seeing some faceting. 
right here. That doesn't look smooth. Now I could go and add more geometry or I could have used the super fine when I loaded it up, but there's no reason to do that when I can fake it with surfacing. So what we'll do is we'll start to break this out into different surfaces and then um, we'll, we'll play with the, uh, the surface smoothing and see if we can uh, dress this up without adding any geometry. Okay, so for starters, I just want to have a base texture that um, we'll use, say, for the, the border. So I can hit Q, which I remember as Q for quality surfaces, or just come down here to surface and see that Q is right here on the button. So Q, now I have nothing selected, that means everything is selected. Okay, that's a, a rule that you want to remember in Lightwave is if nothing is selected, everything is selected. And so I'm just going to call this um, border. Uh, but I'm going to spell it right, B-O-R-D-E-R, -E okay? That's the spelling lesson for today. And I'm going to pick, let's pick, uh, say, a dark gray. And for the other settings, I'm going to leave them off, but I am going to check smoothing. I want to make sure smoothing is, is checked, and I'm going to click OK. Okay, so now when we go to these edges, we can see it's nice and smooth. Now, on these front faces, we start to see uh, undesirable results, which these are smoothing errors. If you ever see those, we need to adjust them. Uh, and we'll take a look at how we can do that. But let's go ahead and break this up into a few more, um, at least one more surface. So I'm going to grab these faces, just these front faces. And then I'm going to use the closed bracket for select connect. So if I go over to the selection tab, connected, I can see it's closed bracket. I'm a big fan of shortcut keys. It allows us to work uh, a little faster. But it's right here, uh, connected under the selection tab. Okay, so let's go ahead and add a surface name for this, so Q. Now, because I have this geometry selected, it's only going to give a new surface name to this geometry instead of all of it, like last time. And we'll just say, um, I'm going to call this Details. And let's give it, um, I'm just going to give it a yellow color for now, because we can always change it. Uh, this, it, we're not stuck with this once we, once we pick it. I'm going to have Smoothing on and click OK. Now we can really see those smoothing errors, and we're going to want to adjust that. So why don't we go ahead and take a look at uh, how we can adjust it um, fairly easily. I'm going to scoot this over and open up the Surface Editor. Now in the Surface Editor, it allows us to go and change attributes long before we ever send it over to Layout. For instance, if I didn't like that uh, gray color, I could come in here and pick a lighter gray color and change that. Now the, the smoothing is turned on and that's working out really good on those parts that were faceted but on these big front faces it's not working out so well. Well the, the smooth threshold is set at 89.5 which is actually a very high default value um, so it's basically saying anything that's at an angle of 89.5 or lower is going to be smoothed and in this case not a good thing. So I usually like to lower it. I'm going to try uh, 30 and um, that works and let's just see if we can go lower 20 yep we can go lower so uh, all these uh, areas are holding up just fine because the angle from polygon to polygon is less than than 20 degrees and on the front faces um, those are 90 degrees so it's not going to try and smooth those so let's go ahead and do that with details let's see if uh, 20 will work there yep so let's go ahead and close this down and take a look so we can see we get nice, smooth, but we didn't add any geometry. It's all just uh, being faked with surfacing. But that means that we're going to be able to render faster and still get the same result as using a lot of geometry. Okay, so now that we have this, I think we should save it. Now, I could save right on top of the last one. I'm not a big fan of that. I like to keep versions. That way I have a version that we could call our low-res version that doesn't have the, uh, the micro bevels on it. So it would be less geometry. So I'm going to go File, Save Object As, and let's just save this as 002. Okay? And so now I know my latest version is 002, and that's going to have uh, the detail that, that I want. Now that I have all of the uh, model complete, and we could keep breaking this up into various surfaces, but we got two surfaces we can work with. Why don't we go ahead and send this thing over to Layout so that we can uh, throw some lights on it, maybe uh, add some more uh, surfacing uh, attributes, you know, tweak those up a little bit, and then get a, get a final render. So with it saved, we'll just come over here to send object to layout and it shoots it over to layout. So now I have the object. Let me, we're in perspective view, so I'm just going to kind of 
zoom out. I'm just uh, left clicking and dragging on the zoom icon right here. So we've got our camera and we've got our light and the most important view is our camera view. So let's take a look, camera view. And this is what we'll see when we render. So if, if I hit F9, we can see our render. Now it doesn't have anti-aliasing and we'll, we'll improve those things uh, here in just a, a little bit. It's got a black background, which in the end, we'll, um, we'll make sure that we can save out an alpha channel so we can give it any kind of background we want later on and say Photoshop. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, close this. And let's go ahead and change our camera angle. This is uh, straight on, so recreating this in a program like Illustrator or um, Freehand or Photoshop would be easy and we wouldn't need a 3D program. But what would be really handy is to grab the camera and I'm just going to move the cam camera and I can get any angle that I want. So let's, um, let's work with, let's see, I'm going to try and get a nice little angle going here. Let's do something like this. And what's nice is you could create this in a 2D program, uh, but then if the client came and said, can we get a slightly different angle? Uh, you'd be recreating it. But with this, we'd just be moving the camera, which is, which is pretty cool. Let's take a look at our light. I'm gonna go to perspective view. And uh, we've got a distant light here, which is gonna produce harsh shadows. It's gonna be very crisp shadows. And that's our default light, but we're not limited to that. So I'm gonna go over to P for properties, which is the same as coming down here and clicking properties. And instead of a distant light, I'm gonna use a dome light. It's just like a distant light, but affords us nice soft shadows. For the angle, if I don't want the shadows to be um, really soft, say I just want um, a little softness to it, I'm just gonna cut that in half and let's try 45. We can go as low as we want. If we go down to zero, it's the same as a distant light, okay? And for my light color, I'm just gonna add a little warmth to it, just a little yellow, okay? And let's see what that's gonna look like in our render. So I'll go ahead and hit F9 and uh, we can see that um, we're not seeing that much of a difference. I also don't have any shadows taking place. So what I'll do is I'll go over to the render tab and render globals. And under the render tab here, I'll choose ray trace shadows. And let's go ahead and make some reflections take place on this. And we have to set that up in the surface editor. But while I'm here, I'm gonna go ahead and turn uh, ray trace reflection on. And let's do a render. Ah, uh, there we go. That's really bringing it to life. We get nice soft shadows and we can start to see the shadows. Now, if we don't want it to be too heavily shadowed, we can use a fill light. So I'm gonna go ahead and just minimize uh, that window and uh, let's add another light. So items, lights, and I'm gonna add another dome light. We have lots of lights to choose from, but I'm gonna call this fill and click okay. And then just take this light. Now moving a dome light, doesn't really um, change anything. It's just about rotation, but I like to go ahead and just move the light so I can see what, um, see you know, see the light and it's not sitting right on top of this geometry. So I'm just gonna kind of point it up to kind of fill in some of those shadows. Let's go to properties and let's make this a cool light. Let's make it kind of a bluish light, just a faint blue. And then instead of 50%, I just want it to be subtle. So I'm gonna try 25. We can always change it. I'm a big fan of doing test renders to see. So let's go ahead and hit F9. Okay, so if we can com compare page up, page down, we can see we're, we're kind of filling in the shadow. Let's go ahead and take that light and let's try it at 50 just to see. Okay, so if we compare uh, I actually like it at 50, so uh, next time I might just try and try the default and then change it, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of liking the, uh, the light kind of filling in those areas. Okay, so now what we can do is start changing some of the, um, the surface attributes. So if I go over to the surface editor, it's just like the surface editor modeler. Um, except the reason why I waited to change some of these attributes while I was here is because we can render and we can get a really good idea of uh, what the surface is doing, what the textures are doing and the attributes are doing when we're able to render. Okay, now I could go in and start changing these attributes like I could say on the border. Uh, right now specularity is zero. I'm going to set that to 80 and we can already see the spec kit here. We're making it shiny. And for glossiness, I'm going to try uh, 30 and let's do a render with that. Okay, and if we compare, see now we're starting to see a lot more of the highlight on the little micro bevel there on the edges. Okay, 
and uh, and that's kind of nice and we can go and just change up all these attributes or one thing we could do is we could take advantage of some of the presets that ship with Lightwave so to do that with the surface editor open I'm gonna go over to Windows presets and you can see we get a whole bunch of, of presets to choose from we can go to fabric uh, generic glass if we wanted to make this uh, a glass uh, logo uh, metal let's play with some metal and all we have to do is kind of scrub through here and say hmm what looks good what would we um, what would we like to uh, dress our um, dress our logo up with and I'm just going to uh, pick something uh, maybe uh, splotched lead double click uh, load settings yes so now it loads those settings on there and fills fills in all these attributes. Let's take a look at what the render is going to look like. Okay, that's much cooler. We can see uh, variations in color, and uh, we got a little bit of uh, a little bit of spec going on there. Uh, we still need to turn anti-aliasing on, and that's going to dress it up. But let's first get this uh, this other surface going. So I'm going to go over to details, and let's see. Let's go over and find something that might work well with that. Let's try this uh, hammered copper. Load the settings. Yes. Okay, now one thing to keep in mind. Let's do a render. There we go. Now we're seeing some smooth, smoothing errors again. And uh, we're going to want to uh, we're gonna want to play with that some. Uh, so I think last time 20 worked. Now it, when we loaded up those presets, it changed our smoothing threshold because that's saved with the surface. Now when you load a preset you're not stuck with it. You can still go in and say you know what for that border I, I liked 80 percent for the spec. Okay and for glossiness I, I kinda liked 30 percent. It's just a starting point. The other thing to remember with the smoothing off, let's do a, a render, is that right now we're we're not giving it much to reflect um, except this uh, black background. So what I'm gonna do is go over to Windows backdrop options and let's just use uh, this gradient and we could if we wanted to add environment image world we could load in an image and have it reflect that but I'm just going to use the gradient and let's see what that looks like okay now we're talking look at this nice reflection and we're taking advantage of something other than black for reflection now you might not want this uh, this gradient in your final image but that's okay because what we can do is we could take advantage of right here where it says image you can choose alpha we can save this alpha image out we can also save a 32-bit image which would be uh, RGBA which would be 8 bits of red 8 bits of green 8 bits of blue and 8 bits of alpha so it saves that that information in the image file okay so let's go ahead and say this is working for us we get uh, some reflection on both surfaces and we've got say um, what we're what we're going for what I'm gonna do is go over to camera properties and I can choose whatever resolution I want to work with right now it's a resolution of 640 by 480 pixels Okay. But we can change it to any of these predefined ones, or we could type in, uh, let's make this uh, 800 by 600. Okay, And we could make it whatever resolution we want. If we were wanted to make print resolution, well, we would just type in the amount of pixels we want for print. And when we head over to Photoshop, I'll, I'll show you one way I go about knowing the, uh, the amount of pixels that I want to work with. Now, we do need to add some anti-aliasing so we don't get these jaggy edges. And you can add as many passes of anti-aliasing as you want. Uh, I'm just going to go with six. That seems to be a, uh, a good number to start with. And then you can increase or decrease uh, as needed. So I'm going to go ahead and do a render okay and as you can see it's bigger because we changed the size but we also we also lost the uh, we, we lost the uh, jagged edges on there so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, want to save this out now you you might want to save your scene as well uh, one thing that you have to remember is that when you're um, working with surface attributes and layout surface attributes are saved to the object and not to the scene so you'll want to save your object as well as your scene so that you don't lose any of the attributes that you worked with. But let's go ahead and just save an image um, and we can save it in a lot of different formats. If we come over to File, Save RGBA, you can see 
all these different formats and you pick the ones that you want. I'm a big fan of working with PNG files and you have the choice of a 24-bit or a 32-bit uh, PNG file, so one with an alpha and one without. Uh, another one would be uh, Targa, big fan of Targa, 24 and 32. Uh, for print, TIFFs aren't bad to work with. Um, uh, they're very large file sizes, but uh, the quality is there. So those are the three I like to work because they're, they're, uh, the compression isn't an issue. They're, they're lossless files. And instead of lossy files like a JPEG. So what I'm going to do is I'll save a couple different ones. I'm going to save a uh, PNG32. So I'll go ahead and click uh, on this right here. And then let's save it as hackbro001.png. Save. But while I've got this open, I can save it as many formats as I want, which is a, which is a handy feature. I'm going to go ahead and uh, save a 32-bit target because I want that alpha. So, just save this as a TGA, okay? And then let's go ahead and save a 24-bit Targa. Let's see, let's do 24-bit. And for this one, I'm just gonna say underscore 24B for 24-bit, just so I know the difference between those two and hit save. Now I've got them saved and why don't we head over to Photoshop and take a look at uh, working with the file in Photoshop. So I'm just going to bounce over to Photoshop and double click to open some files and let's choose all three that we did and open those. Okay so we can see the difference. Now on the um, PNG that was 32-bit you can see when we load it up it's already knocked out the background, which is one of the things that I like about the 32-bit PNG. If, if that's your goal, you'll see over in channels, there's not an alpha channel uh, because it's already knocked it out. So if I add a layer and put it underneath the logo, and let's just grab the paintbrush, I can do put any kind of background that I want uh, and I'm ready to go. So that would be the 32-bit PNG. Uh, pretty handy little setup there. Okay, now We've got the 24-bit, and if we, I'm just going to size that up uh, because it, it looked like there was no anti-aliasing at that size. It's uh, crunching it down and giving us jaggies, but we can see at 100%, uh, it looks nice and clean. If we come over to channels, we'll see no alpha channel, okay, and the background's there. So if you like the background, just save a 24-bit. It's going to be a smaller file size, and you're ready to go. But if I come over to my Targa, let's... Uh, just open that up some and uh, come over to channels we'll see that I've got my alpha channel there if I turn it on we can see it's right there if I hold down control and click on the alpha I can select it and then I can come over here and uh, if uh, if I want for my um, uh, for my layers I can just hit uh, delete and knock it back to the background color or I can make a copy I can invert this so I could go um, select inverse and now it's just selecting logo copy paste now it's on its own layer and I'm ready to go just like I had when I opened up the PNG file okay so that's just a quick look at how we can take an EPS file or an illustrator file load it right into Lightwave Modeler build it up into a 3D object give some basic surfacing and texturing to it set up some lights, do a render, spit out as many different renders as we want, bring them over into Photoshop or another, um, another app, and uh, take it away from there. So if you wanted to um, create a larger version of this, you just change the settings in the camera properties panel. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we could take a look at one way of knowing uh, how you want to go about doing a print res image. So let's go ahead and take a look. I'm just going to come over to File, New, and instead of pixels, I'm going to choose inches, okay? And say I want to do an 8 by 10 inch image, and I want it to be 300 resolution. Okay, I'm going to click OK. And so I have it here. If I go to Image, Size, I can see that I need a uh, 2400 by 3000 pixel image. Okay, so I just come over to, say, this, say that's the resolution that we want to work with. I'm just going to hop over to Layout, go to Camera, Properties, and type in 2400 by 3000. You'll see that the resolution up here turns into Custom, 
and we can type in any uh, value we want there to get whatever resolution uh, image that we want. Just know, the higher the resolution, the longer the render times, but we've got a pretty uh, fast render engine in Lightwave, so uh, it, it handles print res images uh, great. So go to town and, and print those high res images and uh, render those high res images and uh, you'll be ready to go. So again, quick look at taking something from an EPS file uh, or an Illustrator file and taking it all the way through to a finished render in Lightwave.